You're listening to the Technology for Mindfulness podcast, episode 29, hosted by me, Robert Plotkin. Today, I'm going to be speaking with Wendy Palmer, a teacher of both Aikido and leadership embodiment, which combines training of the mind and body to develop wise and skillful leaders in corporations and other organizations. She is the founder of Conscious Embodiment, a somatic process that is informed by both Aikido and mindfulness meditation, and which builds on these traditions to offer simple yet deep techniques that bring awareness of the mind and body's reaction to pressure and an alternative of responding with presence, confidence, and compassion. We're extremely pleased to welcome Wendy Palmer to the Technology for Mindfulness podcast. In today's interview with Wendy Palmer, you'll hear her talk about her program, Leadership Embodiment, which, as the name implies, teaches people to become better leaders by training not only their minds, but also their bodies. And she'll give specific examples of that and explain um, her motivations for developing this program. For today's tip, I'd like to explain to you something which I learned from a martial arts teacher of mine in a specific context. I'd like to give you a general, more general way of, of practicing it, which is that if you're working on developing the ability to get yourself into a particular mental or emotional or state or partic- develop a particular attitude, like a feeling of confidence or strength, Uh, You could, of course, try to work on this directly by training your mind, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's a very useful approach, but the suggestion I'd like to give is to try training your body in the following way, which is let's pick confidence. Pay attention to yourself when you feel confident, or if you haven't been feeling very confident lately, think back to a time when you felt confident and try to put yourself in that situation so that you regain that feeling, but then pay attention to your body. What does that feeling of confidence do to your body? Now, it may have a different effect on you than on someone else. So the exercise here is to pay attention. Does it result in your shoulders becoming relaxed and your breath becoming deeper? Um, in you standing up straighter, whatever it is, the exercise is to pay attention to the effect that that confident state of mind has on your body. And then when you want to practice feeling confident, try putting your body into that physical state. Let's say it was that your shoulders are relaxed. Try relaxing your shoulders and now see if that helps to induce that confident state of mind or attitude. The lesson here being that the body can help induce the mind into a certain state. It's another way of practicing and training the mind uh, more indirectly by training the body first, by putting your body into the state that it would be in when you had a particular attitude you may find that it will actually help to induce that attitude in your mind. So try it out, see what works for you. And we'll be talking a lot more about embodied ways of learning and practicing to become better leaders now with my upcoming interview with Wendy Palmer. Hi, Wendy, and welcome to the Technology for Mindfulness podcast. Hello, Robert. Thank you for inviting me. You're welcome. I'm so glad to have you here uh, for many reasons, one of which is uh, you're a fellow martial artist. <laughs> and I've, uh, I've mentioned martial arts from time to time on the podcast, but you're, you're the first person I've had on who who's, uh, uh, teaches martial arts and who brings that to her teaching of mindfulness and, and leadership. Maybe we could just start out with telling people a little bit about uh, your background and how you bring bring this combined background in martial arts and mindfulness to how you teach uh, 
leadership to people? Well, uh, in the early 70s, I started uh, studying martial arts. And before that, I had been already meditating from about 1968 on. And uh, I had the experience in both cases in the martial arts mat. I sort of had a a talent for it that I could throw 200 pound guys really easily, but I would go home and my 30 pounder would get me off center in 10 seconds. <laughs> so um, I started to get interested. How can I start to bring this off the mat into my everyday domestic life, working with my psychological and emotional sort of being in the world? And similarly, uh, because I was going to meditation retreats and um, focused on different kinds of meditation, I started having some amazing experiences in my meditation uh, hours on the Zafu. And yet when I would leave there and go into the kitchen and, and the phone would ring and the kids would be yelling, it would all go out the window again. So I was really fascinated why I can have the experience so strongly in one area and not in another. And uh, that became a lot of my interest. I was wondering about that. And then uh, secondarily, too, I realized there were many people who were never going to train Aikido, for instance, the art that I do, or any martial art, and many people who were not going to do meditation retreats, but who could really benefit from the principles if they were brought into the world and made accessible. So that's how this thing called leadership, it's now called leadership embodiment developed. It was around 1980 I started doing uh, classes and courses developing this process. Well, it's very interesting, you know, this challenge you faced personally about, maybe I call it how to transfer uh, what you learned and felt and embodied on the mat, both in the martial arts and meditation context to the I hate to call it the real world, <laughs> you know, but off the mat. Uh, could you say a little bit about how, and I assume it was a process over time, you, know, you, you came to be able to integrate those two different contexts? Well, you know, it was an exploration. So uh, people started asking me if I would teach um, a course in martial arts. And I said, well, I can't because it's a whole life process but I can try to distill some of the principles. Um, it was places like J JFK University or people coming to me and they wanted to know about it, but I realized that some of these people were 80 years old and couldn't practice Aikido or they were college students and they were involved in other things. So I started to develop a process that used some very simple exercises that didn't involve any throwing, falling, wrist twisting. And then I also started developing a process to ask the group and myself, what gets in the way of being centered? So unlike martial arts, where you're always trying to be centered, I started to create an environment where we could take ourselves off center and study how that organized. Mm. Can you give us some examples of what you mean by that? I, I mean, I know from experience in martial arts practice, how we uncenter ourselves, you attack each other, you know, you exhibit aggressiveness or things that will naturally draw out a feeling of uncenteredness in, in your training partner. And that gives that partner an opportunity to practice recentering. That's the point is that they're always practicing recentering instead of stopping and really studying. When we push on each other and I tighten up, what tightens up? How much does it tighten? Or does my head go forward? Does it go back? Does it lock? Do my arms push in? Do they lock? Do they pull back? So I started really looking at what's going on with all the subtleties in the body. And then we would take time to talk about what's the implication of that. So I developed a whole model that when I push on people in organizations, if their mm -hmm. head comes forward, it means they're like me, want to jump in and take action. If their head locks, it means they want to stay in control and if their head moves back, it means they want more information before they act. It's like a little 360 in a bottle. And the same with the arms. That's how you speak up in the world. And the same with the hips. So the first thing we do is we really look at uh, what we call it our personality. What's the pattern the personality goes into when it experiences low-grade threat? And then we assume that personality is going to do the same thing with a voicemail and email going into meetings. Because we want people, this comes from the mindfulness bit, 
to start to acknowledge and accept their starting place, which is off center. Instead of always trying to get rid of it or change it, how do you accept it and integrate it so you're not fighting yourself? And just so I understand, you know, I know that your model is called leadership embodiment, and what you've just been describing is something that's very embodied. I mean, you're, uh, I, I don't think what you were just describing is metaphorical. You're talking about people's head literally moving right forward or back or arms moving and, and paying attention to how people people's own bodies respond under right. under th threat, right? Yes. Yeah, so then when we're working in organizations, we start there and I'll cr uh, have someone criticize me first and I'll show how that shows up in a much more subtle way sitting across from them. And then um, we have a practice while the person is pushing on, on us, we practice being uplifted, being open, being extended, being inclusive, being compassionate. And so we show the person how they can move from their reactive self to their centered self. And so then we take it into conversation and we practice criticizing each other and noticing when the criticism first hits, how we tighten up and then giving them the practice and the tools to be able to change the physical pattern in their body. Because if you change your muscle groups in your body, you change the chemicals that are released, which changes your brain. In other words, if you tighten up, you'll release cortisol. Cortisol shuts down the part of the brain that governs big picture, creativity, risk taking. If you extend your arms and you fire extensor muscles and you uplift and stand up straight, sit up straight, um, you'll activate more testosterone, which reinvigorates the part of the brain that governs big picture thinking, creativity, innovation, and risk taking. Now, we all know that too much testosterone on, on its own is annoying. So the third chemical that we engage with is oxytocin. And we tell our clients the way you activate oxytocin, which is the connector chemical that makes you feel connected and warm, is by thinking of something or somebody, when you think of it, makes you want to smile. So if you do that for about five seconds right now, you might feel that little bit of change, that little bit of warmth perhaps in your chest or neck. That's mm -hmm. oxytocin. So what we want them to do is move from their system releasing cortisol to change the body patterning so their system will release testosterone and oxytocin, which changes the way their brain operates. And again, I mean, everything you're describing is ways of um, activating or even actually moving the body in order to change thoughts and feelings and attitudes. Right. Because if you don't, I mean, if understanding something was enough, we'd all be enlightened. I mean, I've, I've <laughs> written books, I've read all the books, I know how I should behave and I don't do it. And the reason I don't do it is because my body will override my mind. In other words, you can tell yourself, don't worry, relax, and your body doesn't respond at all. So you actually have to change the body patterning, the muscle groups. If you shift the muscle groups, you shift the chemicals, you shift the brain. If you don't, you can sit there and try to talk yourself into being relaxed or open, and it'll be a long road is all I can say. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's a very different approach from, I've also read all the books out there on, uh, conflict, uh, resolution and dealing with criticism in the workplace. And uh, it's not that I disagree with them, but they tend to be focused on intellectual strategies, uh, how you can think about what you're hearing and what kinds of things you can say in response uh, tend to be yeah, very verbal, linguistic, logical, uh, perhaps emotional, but still not body centered in terms of movement. Right. Well, they're based on psychology. And we always tell people when we go into organizations, we work in all kinds of organization, but mainly tech, biotech and finance, is that this is based on martial arts and mindfulness, not psychology. And that if understanding was enough, these people are smart. I mean, they're not dumb. We work with, you know, very smart people. but. So when you become stressed, it makes people stupid. And so we're trying to give them a, a tool so that they can more quickly recover their resourceful self. And to do that, you do have to affect the body because, and our little saying is, the body always wins. It will override <laughs> the neocortex. The limbic system will override the neocortex any day. Yeah, one of my teachers who I studied with, uh, for a long time, karate teachers would say uh, the mind follows the body. When we were having trouble 
getting the right mental attitude or posture, you know, he would, he would advise us to move the body in a certain way and let the mind, let it lead the mind. Yes. Well, we can do a little um, exercise. Would you like to try it? Sure. And I'm sitting, I happen to be sitting down right now. You can't see me. Sitting down is perfect. I don't have to see you. I do this all the time. So what we're going to do is we're going to cross our arms and legs and you're going to slump a little bit and tighten up. And I want us both to think about something that happened in the recent past that was annoying. Don't freak yourself out, but just annoying or irritating. Mm -hmm. And we'll do that for about six or seven seconds. Let's both go back to that and remember that. And stop. So I'm sure we both, I certainly got into it right away. Now yes. I'm going to coach us into a different posture. I'd like us both to sit up straighter. You're sitting in the chair, push your hips back in the chair, uncross, and then use the breath instead of in and out. Think of the breath as you inhale, lengthen your spine and the back of your neck. And as you exhale, breathe down your chest, softening, and think of something that makes you smile. We're going to do that one more time. Inhale, a little more dignified, uplifted posture. As you exhale, you soften, thinking of something that makes you smile. Then open your eyes if they're not open and see a point on the far side of the room. And imagine your personal space is like a bubble, which it is, and push your personal space out to that point and then extend it all the way around behind you, above you, to the sides, so that you've really filled the room with your personal space, your energy. And then ask yourself, what would it be like if there was just a little more ease in my body right now? Just let yourself wonder for a few seconds. Okay, now let's think of that same event again. I'm thinking of it. And notice if you think about it, is it different at all? Is there a different quality or experience? Yeah, there's a very, what's interesting is the, the thoughts, I mean, I can conjure up the sight the sounds, other sensations, but the feeling of it is quite different. Uh, coincid uh, just to let you know what it was, I was at the dentist this morning, so that's what I thought of. Oh, wow, yeah. It was just a routine checkup, but when you said irritating or annoying, it certainly is irritating to have your teeth worked on and uh, not pleasant, uh, you know, not the most painful thing in the world. Uh, and yes, when after I did the lengthening, expansion, uh, I th could think of the same experience, but it did not have the same bodily feeling or emotion associated with it when I called it up at that time. Right. So what we just did is I coached you to go from what we call personality, which is our reactive self. Um, we say that the strategies personality uses are control, approval, and safety. That's how we try to manage and create security in the world. I coached you into center, so the centered self, is the experience that we have when we're in the zone or the flow state. We usually feel we're bigger, there's something coming through us, we're not as reactive, and that's our resourceful self. So in this model, what we want to be able to do is move from our reactive self, our personality, to our resourceful self, our center. And the assumption we make is no one stays centered, and as a martial artist, you probably know that, um, but that we can get very good at recovering our center, at flowing between them. But the mindfulness background is, unlike martial arts, we're not trying to cover up our off-centeredness or move from too quickly. We're actually trying to integrate it. Now, I'm an avid gardener, and when you garden, you have to put compost on the soil. And I had a Tibetan teacher who said, the problem with you Americans is you throw your garbage away and buy compost. And he meant that <laughs> psychologically and emotionally. So the idea is that we accept and integrate our reactive self and it becomes our compost. I refer to it as our shitty little self, but it's mm -hmm. absolutely part of our humanity. So we're not trying to get rid of it or transform it or be cent only centered. What we actually want to do is be able to move fluidly between these parts of ourselves and not get stuck in our reactive self. I wonder if you could... Either give an example or uh, talk a little bit about how this relates to leadership, you know, which is a main focus of yours and how, how people can bring that to leadership, particularly because I think in our culture, people often have the thought that if I'm a leader, 
I have to not have any of these negative qualities or be in denial of feeling off centered, yeah. right? Or, or if I am, I need to get back to being centered or at least give the appearance of that as quickly as possible. Well, if they're having that view, then they're primarily caught up in approval. So some people are just want to stay in control the whole time. I do notice that when we work with people who are vice presidents, senior vice presidents and that kind, they tend to be very much in control and the people that step down tend to be very much in approval. But what we do is we teach them how to have a bigger leadership presence because we say that fundamental tenant of great leadership is the feeling of inclusion, the message we're in this together. And if you think about someone like Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King, Gandhi, um, they really included big groups of people or His Holiness the Dalai Lama can do that. And so rather than just talk about leadership presence, we define it. So we'll say neuroscience has coined this term called a peripersonal space. And what they say is our brain tends to map everything within our reach as us. And also, if you have a family, your brain will map your family as part of you. Now, you could be at a distance. You could be in Europe and call home, and that person at home is part of you. But you go to a meeting, and the person on the other side of the table is other. You go out in the world, and the people are other. So what we want to train our leaders to be able to do is map people in their teams, even in their organizations, as part of them, actually really part of them. and. If you've ever been in the presence of someone who is a great leader, like His Holiness the Dalai Lama, you can actually feel the presence. It's tangible. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we try to um, help our leaders understand mirror neurons. If they are more warm and inclusive and open and uplifted, people are going to be more receptive to what they have to say. Therefore, they can be more influential. Therefore, they can keep difficult conversations going. Yeah, it's a it's a very different model of leadership than uh, certainly I often feel like I'm exposed to. Well, we 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 have tools. Uh, once we've established this idea of um, the practice of inclusiveness, then we work with uh, criticism, and with somebody just like a little bit what we did. They're tight, and somebody criticizes them, or they believe they're criticizing them. They'll take it personally and react. If they can apply this technique that I just did with you, then we have, you know, in martial arts, ideally, you try to let the attack land in the space. You try mm-hmm. not to let the attack hit you. Correct? Right. Yes. So I took that and I applied it to criticism. So if I can let the criticism land in the space and look at it and get some distance from it, I'm going to be able to be more creative and more skillful in how I respond to it. If that criticism lands in me and I take it personally, I'm going to be more reactive. So we give people tools to learn how to take criticism less personally so they can keep a conversation going. And then the third piece we give them is how to speak up or advocate skillfully, how to take a stand, how to step into their power, um, and still keep the sense of warmth and inclusiveness without making people other. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I know from from my martial arts experience, different martial arts certainly take different approaches uh, uh, to that, you know, and there are some that will, uh, if I can draw the analogy, you know, respond with something like a punch, you know, <laughs> that hits and is more, more treating, I would say, the other person as, as an other, yes. you know, than a response that... Um, uh, how would I say, harmonizes, let's say, with the other person rather than uses force. Correct. And so um, it allows people, leaders, to be able to keep conversations going. I mean, to me, what a good leader has to do is two things. They have to give the message, we're in this together, even if they do not like the other person, they still need to include them. And they need to be able to keep difficult conversations moving forward so that they can have projects move forward and they can work with people on new ways of finding how to deliver their products. You know, it's, it, I had this conversation about difficult conversations with, uh, with startups. I don't know. Uh, I assume you deal with a variety of different types of organizations. Uh, I've definitely found that, uh, to generalize a little bit, a lot of 
younger people involved in startups, particularly if the founders are all friends, you know, have social relationships outside of the company, uh, can tend to be somewhat avoidant of having difficult conversations, even if it, whether it happens to be about how to organize things or about how to deal with conflicts when they arise. Uh, yeah. I, I wonder how you, you know, it, it sounds like you could apply this same general model to that situation. Well, you can. I mean, the idea is you can apply it anywhere. That's my, that's my view in the, in the rest, in the bathroom, in the kitchen, um, at home, at work, um, walking down the street in the grocery store. If we're more inclusive, if we have a sense of warmth, if we can say what's true, um, we're going to be more effective in the world. And because of limbic resonance, as it's called, and mirror neurons, the way we are in the world affects other people before we even open our mouth. In some cases, it affects people over distances as well. So if we're responsible for the vibe in the old days, as we said, or the message that we're putting out into the world, we can make better decisions about what we're emanating before we open our mouth. Otherwise, we open our mouth and we have the platitudes and we say the right thing and we give a completely different message with our um, energy. Yeah, I mean, it, it resonates a lot with my own experience, and it it, it brings up a, a challenge uh, for uh, to bring this to the technology side of technology for mindfulness. I think some of the challenges of people and organizations working remotely from each other, communicating uh, like we are now by voice only, without seeing each other, without being in the same room, and certainly just by text, whether it be email or letter or text message, where a lot of the physical direct limbic cues are, are missing or muted or distorted in some way. I wonder what, what advice you can give to people or learnings you've had about you know how to maintain the lessons and benefits of this in, in situations where people are not physically present with each other. Well, we work with quite a few organizations where they have a lot of teleconference meetings. And I have um, one team that says their leader is often remote. Uh, they can tell when she's smiling, even though they can't mm. see her. Um, it's quite interesting how much if people pay attention, you can catch just through the voice, through the quality um, we tell people if they're centered before they send an email or a text, the quality of the text could be different. Even one word could be different. Um, mm -hmm. So we have a centering app that we uh, suggest people get, and they can set it to remind them as much as they want every hour. And it just pops up and it says leadership embodiment. Mm -hmm. And then you can do a little five-second uplift, open up a little bit, and settle. And there you go. You mm -hmm. shifted your energy from maybe a little bit more tight or in the future to a little bit more present. Um, there's lots of wonderful apps that can remind you. But the idea is that first we have to give them a pattern to go to, and then they have to be reminded to do it. Otherwise, if you just tell someone open, they don't know what that means. Or you tell someone mm -hmm. relax, mm -hmm. they're, unless they're trained in sports or martial arts, they're likely to collapse, not relax, because many people mm -hmm. don't know the difference between collapse and relax. Right. To breathe, they might take a big inhale, in which case they're going to trigger their sympathetic nervous system and trigger themselves further. So there needs to be some clarity and direction about what we mean by the right kind of breath that will help you center, what we mean by relaxation, what we mean by opening. So it's, they, they actually need a process because otherwise people will, and if you tell them to get grounded, everybody just puts their energy down then the quality mm -hmm. of heaviness happens, and then the conversation will be heavy. So we actually have people lighten up. So the quality of the conversation is lighter, so it's easier to move difficult um, conversations along. So we have very specific directions. Then once somebody has that, they can do it whether they're on the phone, before they send an email. They can do it throughout the day. They can use their technology to remind them. And what we ask is that you take five or ten seconds. It's all that's needed. You don't need a half an hour of sitting. You just need a few seconds to change your muscle groups, which immediately reboots the chemicals that are being released into your body, which starts to shift the way your brain operates. Yeah, so you you give people some basic training so they have a, a, a certain degree of foundation 
in the skills and being able to embody them so that when you then are giving them these reminders, uh, they have a basis on which to call call the the experience back up within themselves if i'm understanding it that's that's that is it that's what we're doing and then you know there's lots of levels people can go into it much more deeply we've got lots of processes we can take people through but the fundamental processes are the three pieces of inclusiveness how to listen without reacting and how to speak up without being attached to the result so that's a big one because everybody when they speak up they want to be heard and we give them practices to say what's true for you, even if people don't hear you. And then I point again to Gandhi, Martin Luther King, Nelson Mandela, who probably said what their process was a thousand times before it really took hold. So a lot of our people, we help them learn how to stay on target with their what's true for them and not rely on someone else accepting, nodding, agreeing, but to really how do they keep their power? Mm. With, without becoming aggressive. Yeah, that, that kind of a balance is really challenging, particularly in our culture, which tends to value that kind, or almost equate assertiveness with aggressiveness. Yes. But, you know, there's people like, I mean, I have a place in South Africa, and Nelson Mandela is one of my heroes. I saw him once. And, you know, here's someone who is very powerful, but very warm, very open, um, really good listener very patient. Uh, he embodied, embodies a lot of the qualities that we try to encourage people um, to cultivate rather than that feeling of being aggressive and being tough and, and so on. And on the other hand, not being what you said before, not being relaxed. I like that term, not being relaxed in a collapsed way, Yes, uh, which would be the other extreme Right. A lot of people, if you say relax, they will, you can watch them collapse because they don't know the difference because they don't have, they, unless they've studied yoga or martial arts or they've been quite experienced in a sport, they don't know the difference between relax and collapse, your everyday person. Also, when you say take a breath, almost everyone will take a deep inhale. It's the exhale that calms you down, not the inhale. Mm -hmm. The inhale the sympathetic nervous system. That's your fight and flight system. The exhale triggers the parasympathetic nervous system. That's your sort of settle down, calm down system. So we have to actually tell people, you take an inhale, your exhale should be twice as long as your inhale. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Breathe down instead of out, you'll get a further experience of settling. Yes. I, I mean, I, this is, I think any of us who trains in yoga, like you said, or martial arts or, or meditation is always working on the breath. That's something we never never stop doing, but I've been very appreciative throughout my life that I had the opportunity to start learning um, how to breathe you know, from a young age. Yeah. Uh, yes, because many people, we work in tech a lot and they have no, they're not connected to their bodies and they're, they're not aware of these things. And, you know, I tell a lot of my clients you're doing because they're much younger than I am. I'm much older, but uh, you're doing it now. But honestly, it's not sustainable to work the way you're working. You're you're holding a lot of stress, a lot of tension. Um, you don't have a lot of oxygen and um, you're, you don't have a lot of blood flow. And so your body can't reboot itself and rebalance itself when you're carrying all this low grade stress all the time. Right. And when you're, you're um, not really fully present in your body for such long periods of time. Yes, the body will act out. So um, I wonder if you could tell tell us a little bit more about maybe just the the practicalities of how you you do your trainings, um, how people can access them. I think uh, it was only recently that you started doing teaching online. You know, could you tell us a little bit about how you teach this leadership embodiment? What forms does it take? Yes. Um, well, it's total, it's different if we are hired by an organization, then we work specifically with a team or the leaders, or we'll do big groups in an organization. Um, we try to really tailor it to that situation. In terms of public courses, uh, we have people pretty much in most continents, not South Africa, not mm. America, but definitely um, Europe, Asia, Africa, the U.S., Canada. So the idea is that we have 
um, the preliminaries, which is a level one, a level two course, and then a retreat with me. I don't teach level ones and twos. They're usually two day courses and they're taught by associates or people who've been through the training and are trained to lead the courses. And then um, once they've been through the prerequisites, they can apply for a coach training, which is a six month training. And then we teach people how to coach others in this. It's a very tricky thing because teaching people's bodies is very different than teaching their minds, especially mm-hmm. when you're working with people in organizations and executive types. And so the six month coach training, then we certify people to be able to either use this as a standalone with their clients as we do, or how to integrate it. Um, they're welcome to integrate it into existing coaching processes. So those are our public offerings. Uh, and they're all available on our website. You can see what's going on and where in the world <laughs> they're going on. And then if organizations, um, usually it's word of mouth. We, as I said, work primarily in tech, biotech, some finance and insurance, and then a smattering of other uh, organizations as well. You can see on the website the kind of organizations that have invited us in. I'm just curious to know, when you say you work mostly in tech and biotech, has that just been where the interest has come from? Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, I never, uh, my joke is my marketing strategy is I say yes. Uh, So um, we've never tried to market. I was just invited to come in. There's a woman who was working in a biotech, coaching in a biotech organization. She took a course with me. She asked me to come in and work with a client. That client asked me to work with her team. Then that team, somebody went to the, that was in regulatory, they went to the tech part. Then I started working with tech in that biotech. Then those people left and went to Salesforce. They took us to Salesforce. Some went to um, uh, Oracle. We went there. Um, And it's just kind of then some other biotech, they've gone to other organizations and they've taken us. Uh, and then some of the tech people moved up to Gates Foundation. We went up there. So it's usually the people we've worked with um, will go to a different organization and then bring us in. Or I've done a bunch of work in India, and some of the people who came to the public courses were from McKinsey, and then they moved to Accenture, so they brought us in there. So it works sort of like that. Plus, I've written three books, and so sometimes people will get a hold of one of my books, and they'll contact us that way. I was just wondering, uh, and I have no idea what the answer is, you know, whether there's anything about uh, high tech or the and, uh, any aspect of the culture in, in high tech or biotech that would predispose people to being interested in uh, a mindfulness or martial arts based approach to leadership. I mean, we're in the Silicon Valley area and there's a wonderful book called Chasing Fire. And they talk about how the Silicon Valley CEOs and people like that use these radical things to try to do what we do, which is how do you inhibit the part of your brain that's always trying to create security so that you can be free for creativity and innovation and you can take risks. Mm. And they talk about how Sergey Brin microdoses acid and does extreme sports. And some of them do martial arts and some of them do extreme meditation things, Steve Jobs example and things. So a lot of these uh, tech company people are really pushing the envelope of their own experience to try to find ways to inhibit this sort of careful, secure, security based part of themselves so that they can really try stuff because not all of us are Elon Musk. And so how do we get more in that direction? I mean, Elon Musk says, if you're not failing, you're not innovating enough. Right. Right. Uh, I mean, there has been, a, I think, a much greater acceptance in recent years uh, of that idea that success is the result of a long string of failures. Uh, different than when I when I was coming up. But I think if you practice mindfulness, I, I think for myself, martial arts, but any kind of sport, any kind of performance, it could be music. You know, you just know that you make mistakes, uh, call them failures all the time. Uh, and that if you were to let those stop you, you would never go anywhere. Right. But even though you know it, it's still people are still really affected by the fear of failure. So giving them some tools so that they can move to a different part of themselves, because there's 
almost always going to be a part of ourselves that is affected by failure. But we don't want to flatline that part of ourselves, so to speak. We really want to be able to shift to a resourceful part. I mean, we're not going to totally get rid of our fears, but we don't have to let our fears dominate us. But they're going to come up. And so giving people tools so that they can touch into this resourceful self, and then the the fearful self will come back. And that's the mindfulness piece. We just relax with it. And we say, ah, there you are. And yes, and now I can shift again to my resourceful self rather than trying to override or transform or push away the fearful self. Right, right. Uh, And I wonder when it comes to teaching the course that uh, now that you're doing it online, uh, you know, going back to my, my question before about the difference in an organization between people working together face to face and working remotely. I wonder, you know, if you have any observations about your own experience now teaching leadership embodiment online and, you know, what the, the promises and the challenges of that have been. Well, you know, we hope to continue to develop our online course, but at this point, the people that we've partnered with, um, have been great because they've tried to develop an online course that's somewhat interactive. In other words, if you go into it, um, first they ask you, what do you know about embodiment? And then um, a whole algorithm brings up a cloud on the other side of uh, your screen. And this is what other people have said. So you're like, oh, you're not alone here. And then we take you through with a Vimeo clip, a little exercise. And then we ask you some questions. And when you respond to it, you get on the other side of the screen, the cloud comes up and it brings you other people's responses. And so it has a little feeling of interactiveness that you're not just alone going through this thing, that you're mm-hmm. hearing, mm-hmm. seeing what other people. And then it has a um, bit that can set you up that reminds you, that can send you things every minute. This is what other people are responding to. This is what they're thinking. So I think with the online thing, the trick is is to keep it, um, keep it alive and keep it, it uh, pinging the person who's going through um, on a regular basis so that they, it's like somebody out there keeping you accountable or saying, how are you doing with it? Or mm-hmm. Gee, this is what I discovered. And so I think in that way, the online thing is certainly better than if they just take a course and it's only them, you know, just filling out, looking at the video filling out the questions and there's nothing coming back. So I think the fact that something coming back makes it feel Mm -hmm. that there's more interactions and, and flow. So we're, we're, we're hoping to keep refining that and to get it more interesting and to add more pieces to it. But um, then some people say they've taken the online, therefore they want to come and take a course in person. They're, they're gung ho to do the next step. Or we have leaders who've taken our course or we've come in, brought it into the organization that want to spread it out to a larger team, but don't want to actually, you know, have the team come to a room and do a whole thing with us. So then they give them the online platform so they can have a feeling for these tools as well. Oh, that's great. Uh, and I wonder, you know, you said in the beginning that you spent time trying to figure out how you could create something like this, which enabled people to get the benefit, uh, or at least a significant part of the benefit that you had gotten from intense long-term training, you know, in something that was shorter, you know, not spending a decade studying Aikido, uh, for example, uh, or more, but I, I, you know, I wonder um, what you could uh, s- say about uh, you know the amount of time that you think is helpful to people. Let's say in the initial training, and what kind of ongoing work you know people should be doing, or maybe the better way to put it is benefit from doing if they're uh, practicing the leadership embodiment that you take, and what are the kind of trade offs between trying to get a benefit relatively efficiently and the need for people to be practicing regularly just because this kind of work takes ongoing effort and doesn't happen overnight. Yes. So um, we have, we recommend three levels of practice to our people. One is what we call dedicated practice, which is 
we recommend that everyone does something. It's often in organizations called self-care, looking after yourself. So whether it's going for walks regularly, doing yoga, doing a sit, um, biking, hiking, swimming, do something to look after your body so you're moving your body and you're doing your health. So while the person is doing that, they can be working with a centering practice. Because you can work with a centering practice while you're doing anything. Sitting on your cushion, you can inhale and uplift. You can exhale, think of something that makes you smile. You can extend your personal space into the room. And you can soften your shoulders a little bit. Boom, right? So that can take five seconds. It could take 10. You could spend 30 seconds playing with it. Um, We have this bit where you invite inspiration instead of trying to find, in my case, instead of trying to find compassion, I'm a very reactive person. (laughs) Um, When I think of Mother Teresa, I I call it my posse. Then all of a sudden I feel more compassionate. When I think of the Dalai Lama, all of a sudden I, my mind opens and there's a sense of what I call wisdom is expansive mind. When I need more confidence, I think of the founder of Aikido or Nelson Mandela. And then I get that little feeling. Mm -hmm. So anybody can do that, kind of develop what we call your posse so that you're connected to these archetypes. That When you think of them, you get a little bit stronger feeling for those qualities so you don't have to find them inside yourself, which is always mm-hmm. um, a fight. Uh, I, I sort of invite them to come through me. So that can be done in conjunction with what we call dedicated practice. I think the most valuable aspect of practice is the second, which is what we call um, that sense of just ritual. So the ritual can be uh, five times a day, 10 times a day, 20 times a day, and it can be five seconds, 10 seconds, or two seconds. And the idea is that you have very particular times and or places. That's why we have the app. It pings me once an hour and it just goes, you know, the same way when I get a text. And when I hear that, I immediately sit up straighter. I take an exhale, think of something that makes me smile, and I push my personal space out. I try to open and expand. Um, to do that as much as possible throughout the day. You know, I learned that I could sit for an hour in the morning, have a very special experience. I could train for an hour and a half, two hours in the evening, and in an hour it would be gone away. Mm -hmm. So more important is to do it on a regular basis for very short periods of time throughout the day, five seconds, 10 seconds. And then there's the third level of practice is whenever – you can remember, which most people associate with stress. Oh, I'm stressed, so I should center. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But the ritual practice is the one that gets you to just to do it, even if you think you're centered. I always joke you can center anyway. So far, no one has become over-centered, and if you do, you'll be the just, <laughs> yeah. So you could just do a little five-second uplift, expand and settle, and just take that breath. And there you have it. You've done a practice that shifted your energetic pattern so that's how we really encourage people it's the not the amount of time you do it but the how often you do it the more often you do it once an hour and then whenever you can remember you're going to create more of a shift than if you did it for an hour straight in the morning and then went off into your day and went back into your old habit yeah i I really appreciate these suggestions uh you know I hear it from a lot of people who say they don't have time. Now, these are all things that anyone has the time for. And I find myself telling myself that. <laughs> I don't just hear it from other people. And I, I do set aside time uh, for formal practice, but I, I do both. You know, In addition, I, I do these kinds of things uh, during the day. And I, uh, their point is really well taken that it's not uh, just about the amount of time, but but when it gets done, uh, I, I certainly have had that experience of feeling very grounded or, for example, of knowing what my intention is uh, for the day and then finding that I remember it again when the day is over. <laughs> if, I haven't, if I haven't been reminding myself of it throughout the day, you know, it, it, that's just the way the, the mind works, particularly if we're, if we're being uh, feeling pulled in, in many different directions you know and and the other thing i like about the suggestions is there are things that could be done if we're thinking about within an organization by people 
uh, you know, whether or not the organization is bought into this or has set aside anything, I can imagine that when you work with organizations who in some way, you know, set, uh, create some structure that helps support this, it must help the individuals within it. It's very, certainly very challenging for individuals to, to do anything like this within a, a workplace on their own. It can be done, but you know, to do it as an individual is certainly much harder than doing it with the support of an organization in some well, way. Well, you know, with the organizations we work with are so big, you can't get the whole organization. But for instance, if we work with a team of whatever it is, 12, 20, 40 people, and they're all doing it, when they have their meetings, when they're walking down the hall, we have a cute thing that's a very quick one. Um, I was uh, coaching a general counsel once, and um, she was somebody who was very aggressive. They often asked me to coach what they call the handfuls. And she would always move mm-hmm. forward on the table with her arms crossed, and she was aggressive. And so I started working with her to get her to sit up and to soften her chest and not cross her arms, to stay more open. And she said, oh, I can't sustain it. It's so uncomfortable. And I said, well, just do these little five-second bursts. And she said, like a lizard push-up? <laughs> You know how lizards do those little push-ups? Yeah. And so it made me smile. So we joke, a lizard push-up is just like a boom. You just uplift and open for a few seconds. And people love it. Yeah. So they'll walk down the hall or go into a meeting and someone will go, lizard push-up, and everybody sits up a little straighter. Um, smiles, because <laughs> it makes you smile. Um, and then we also have a little fun one. We try to make it fun and easy so people can just do it really quickly and enjoy. Um my Aikido teacher once, Japanese man, years ago, was frustrated with us in a seminar because first we were too stiff and then we were too sloppy. And he was trying to communicate what he was looking for. And he said, I want to see you're noble. I want to see you're awesome. I want to see you're shiny. And I just loved that. So what we tell people is you can just do a quick three-step noble, which is sitting up straight, awesome, which is expanding out, and shiny, which is your warmth. And if you boom, boom, boom. And so we hand out little pens and bags that say noble, awesome, shiny people. (laughs) Because, you know, some part of them really wants that. And so to give them little swag and little ways to do it, fun little ways to center that take five seconds, but make a difference. Then it starts to spread like a positive virus. Um, Mm -hmm. and, And it's not like this laborious thing where now you have to breathe and now you have to sit up and now you should. It's more like do a lizard push up. Or let's do a noble, noble, awesome, shiny. And uh, makes people smile. And when people have that energy, uh, they really are more resourceful. Yeah, and I can imagine. I mean, I know just from meditating with other people, knowing that other people share that that feeling with you and, and support you in it and you support them, you know, it, it builds on itself when you have that kind of a community. Yes, absolutely. And then, you know, giving them sort of ways to keep themselves accountable. You know, have their friend help them. Ask somebody, you know, what I'll say to my leaders, ask one of your reports to remind you, to center. And then the report might get interested. What is this? And you might tell them. And it sort of starts to create, I always say, energy organizes around what is most articulate in our system. So if people can speak about it, if they can relate with it, it helps people stay accountable to themselves so they don't get amnesia as often. That's great. Yeah. Small, but significant improvements. <laughs> yeah. We're trying to create this pathway in the brain, kind of like a, you know, it starts out in the jungle and you're hacking away with a machete and then it's a footpath and then it's a dirt road and then pretty soon you can drive on it. And um, you're always going to go on the superhighway first, but you can train yourself to exit the superhighway and go to this other way of being that is much more resourceful and creative. And it's a lot better for your health as well. That's great. Well, this has been really great talking to you, uh, learning about leadership embodiment. I'm thinking of it as embodied leadership. The connection to the body is not something we hear about very much when it comes to to leadership. So I I really appreciate that and, and the way in which you've integrated your long experience with mindfulness and martial arts into all of this really unique and illuminating for me. So thanks so much for being on the Technology for Mindfulness podcast, Wendy. Oh, it's been my pleasure. And thank you for being open and listening. And um, if there's anything I can do to support you going forward, let me know, because that's what we're into is helping each other 
make this a better world to be in together, to work in and to really access our potential. Will do. Absolutely. Thank you so much. All right. You have a wonderful day. Thanks for joining us for this Technology for Mindfulness podcast with me, Robert Plotkin, and today's guest, Wendy Palmer, the founder of Conscious Embodiment, which combines training of the mind and body from mindfulness meditation and the martial art of Aikido. You can find out more about Wendy and her work at leadershipembodiment.com. If you liked today's episode, please leave us a review on iTunes and share the episode with your friends. Those and all other links are in the show notes. And check out our blog at technologyformindfulness.com for information and tips about science, technology, and mindfulness. I'm Robert Plotkin, and I'll join you next time on the Technology for Mindfulness podcast with Lodro Rinsler, co-founder of the Mindful Meditation Studio in New York City.